and what debt should be and where debt should be and what it should not do. And people are just concerned with the same three or four topics for the last three years. So let me help, Mr. Speaker, through you. These estimates, sir, attempt to do, aim to do, and we believe deliver in three areas. Making sure that people, first and foremost, are taken care of through our social protection systems and through new social protection measures. That's the first. The second is to make sure that there is job-led economic activity through the public sector investment program. And we have, as government, to be able to drive that activity because we are in a situation where we have a private sector that over the various pauses and shutdowns have had to almost come to a complete standstill. And we as a government said, we are not at all going to separate people from their work in the public service. We are going to maintain, and in some cases increase, not through permanent employment, but where it is required, we are going to maintain public sector employment. We are going to not only that, expand the capital works program so that those who are not currently employed or those who have recently been unemployed in the private sector have an opportunity to earn again. And so these estimates are driven by a very ambitious, you heard it from the Honorable Member for St. Michael West Central and others, the Honorable Member for Christchurch West and others, by a very ambitious capital works program that is about using the time of this pause to be able to invest in the kinds of basic infrastructure needs like housing and refurbishing key government buildings and building roads. But not only are we investing in having that infrastructure established, but we're making sure that people can work on these projects because we have a private sector, not because they don't want to, but because of the economic challenges have had to pause. So that's the second driver of these estimates. That's what these estimates are about. That's what we are aiming to deliver for the people of Barbados. And the third area that is driving this, that I hope to spend a bit of time on this morning, sir, has to do with the question of implementation and the ease of doing business. And in many ways, I feel as if we talk about ease of doing business and it's become a bit of a, it's become a, bit of a slogan. It's become something that people say and people start to roll their eyes. But I know that people weren't rolling their eyes when they were able to get their passports more quickly. I know that Barbados weren't rolling their eyes when they were able to get their police certificate of character online. This is not rhetoric, sir. This government is not about rhetoric. It is about delivering. But I will say, but I will say that it is not enough to mobilize resources for capital works as the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Investment has done so that the line ministries, the key infrastructure line ministries can execute. It's not enough to mobilize those resources and then to identify with the ministers what works need to be done and by when. But we have to make sure that we get the implementation right. We have to make sure that we get the execution right. And so the third area that these estimates are about is making sure that we have the platform for delivery, not just in the public sector, but that we have the platform for, for, for the establishment of new business and for regular Barbadians to be hassle-free when they are doing business on their own account or with the government of Barbados. Sir, I have seen circulating in some quarters the notion that Barbados has no stimulus for individuals. And I'm sure that the Honorable Member for Christchurch East Central and the Honorable Prime Minister and other members in this chamber 
having sat day after day, night after night, with other members of the economic team to scratch our heads to figure out how do we get support to people. We, 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 we have to confess that then there is a certain sense of bewilderment at the notion that there is no stimulus. And I think where people might be led to this notion is because of the use of the word stim stimulus. And it's not a word that we, that we use because the truth is that this, this Barbados Civil Party government has always been about providing to people. And so when the chips are down, and we know that people need help, but we don't give it any fancy names, we just help. When people are wondering how they will survive, and, and, and because we know that that is the responsibility of government, then we just get it done. But, and, and I always say, you know, I, I don't believe that, that standing in this honorable place is about patting ourselves on the back, but I do believe that it, 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 it must be said that there have been tremendous investments in making sure that people can keep their head above the water in this difficult time. Mr. Speaker, even in a crisis, we have not allowed the things that have prevented other countries or the, pre or the things that you would expect to prevent you from carrying out the things that you need to carry out. We have not allowed things like an absence of cash flow, or an absence of cash, or an absence of capital, or an absence of instruments to be able to stop us from doing what we needed to do, not in the last estimates of revenue and expenditure, or in these current estimates, sir. And I'll tell you what I mean. When we started at the beginning of the crisis of, the COVID-19, there was $17 million in the unemployment fund at the NAS. There was $17 million in the unemployment fund at the NAS. The government of Barbados has paid $150 million in unemployment benefits to date. What does that mean? It means that there are other jurisdictions that have had to say, well, we would like to help, but we're not able to do it. We have had to take certain decisions to make sure that we use the instruments that are available to us, that we undertake concessional borrowing, as all the world has done. We have not had the option that developed countries had to print money. You heard it from the Honorable Prime Minister yesterday. And people will say that the matter of unemployment benefits are in an entitlement, and they're right. But you still have to have the wherewithal to be able to deliver. And we didn't stop and say, but hang on, we don't have it. We found it. And in a situation, sir, where the systems that exist, whether it was welfare or whether it was NIS or whatever, whether it was even the, 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 the healthcare infrastructure, there is no system in any country in the world that was ready for COVID-19. None. That's true. None. And the reason that people are calling from everywhere, and is the reason I made the point, sir, about documenting what we did for this crisis, because the reason people are asking is that they want to know how this little island, what we used to say in the Caribbean Sea, well, the two of them, as the Minister, as the minister of Barricade Affairs would tell you. But that was their, what they taught us at school, according to the song. They want to know how it is. That really seamless way you all are able to deliver. I, I, I want to say further, sir, that the developed countries that were able to print money were then able to spend, on average, 8% of their GDP on, on what people 
consider a stimulus or a response to COVID. Developing countries, and this has been part of our international advocacy, developing countries were not in that position. Developing countries are not in that kind of position. And so on average, developing countries were only able to spend 1% on the COVID-19 economic response. The government of Barbados, sir, on individual benefits alone, I am not counting hospital refurbishment, I'm not counting Harrison's Point, I'm not counting ice, um, quarantine facilities, I'm not counting all the other facilities we had to stand up, I'm not counting Blackman and Gallup and then the hotels that we set up on this last, I am not counting any of that, sir, I'm not counting the best program, I am not counting any of those things. This government spent 2.5% of GDP Developing countries globally spent on average 1%. We spent 2.5% of today's GDP on individual benefits alone. Benefits going to people. So I want to address the notion that government has not been spending, and, and, and not going to the care packages either. And not counting the very ambitious exercise of trying to get food to people that was executed by our um, armed forces, Barbados Defense Force. It was not perfect. Nobody has ever tried to do it. Often when somebody has never tried to do something, you don't get perfection at, uh, at the first shot. But the point I am making is that there has been all kinds of innovation and there have been all kinds of programs and there's been all kinds of investment in making sure that first, first, people can survive. We've also had some lessons in the area of social protection, sir. Because one of the things that we realized is that under the terms of the National Insurance Scheme, self-employed people made contributions, made lower contributions, so they were able to get pension. But they were not able to get unemployment benefits. And at the start of COVID, that's where we were. And that's why we created the business cessation fund, which was to make sure that self-employed people would be able to qualify for unemployment benefits. And, and it was something that we realized was lacking, and that's why we have extended that facility. We've extended that measure. So, sir, I want us and when I talk about having practical discussions, I want us to understand that COVID-19 has also had to teach us some things. And I don't ever like to believe that I for sure, but that any of us is above learning or being taught or being given the wherewithal to be able to improve what we deliver to the people of Barbados. We have to learn every day. If we don't learn how to deliver better for people, then why are we here? And so that's what we've been able to do. We've been able to realize that notwithstanding the fact that Barbados was one of the first and remains one of the only countries with the kind of social security program that we have, notwithstanding that, we still had room for improvement and had improvements to make in terms of how we were able to deliver for people. And sir, on that matter, I have to. I have to say something about this minimum wage measure that will be in place from April 1st. Because we always say that government has more powers than tax and spend. Government has more powers than tax and spend. And one of the, oh, I mean, I don't like to use hyperbolic language, but one of the nightmares of the last administration was that we didn't see much, we didn't see much work on regulation and legislation and the kinds of things that don't cost money, but that make people's lives easier. 
And so I'm seeing the discussion, sir, on the timing of the minimum wage. And, and, and whenever I read the headlines, I ask, I, I ask myself, when is a good time to make sure people can eat? When is the best time to make sure people can eat? When is it not a good time to make sure people can send their children to school? You know, the, the interesting thing is when I hear people say that the timing of, of, of the minimum wage is not good, is that the funny thing is, and a member for St. George North pointed it out, is that we are not even looking at what people in other jurisdictions call a fair wage. Because a fair wage includes all other kinds of things. Making sure that people can spend, make sure that people, people's um, work in a particular sector is valued a certain way, and making sure people can afford all kinds of baskets and goods, of goods and services. If we were looking at that, which we very well could be, and which we probably would be under different economic circumstances, but if we were looking at that, we would be talking about a wage that is far, far higher than what is being proposed today. What we are actually looking at is a minimum wage, which is just that. It is the very minimum income below which people simply cannot survive. So defined in that way, sir, this is exactly the right time in the context of COVID-19, when far too many people are struggling, to look at the question of a minimum wage. It is precisely the right time. I don't know when could be a better time. Sir, the current minimum wage is $6.25, or $250 for a 40-hour week. And that was put in place in 2012. Now, that means that being still at the level of 2012, where prices were in 2012, it hasn't kept pace with the almost 45% increase in prices in the country over the last nine years. The poverty line as established in the last survey of living conditions in Barbados in 2016 was $636.17 per person per month. That's about $160 a week. What does that mean? That a four-person household, and many of us know that a lot of our households have far more than four people, female-headed households tend to be larger than households headed by men. A four-person household, depending on a single income of $250 a week, receives $62.50 per person. Now, remember, the poverty line is $160 per person per week. That means that if you are earning less than that and have to pay for food and have to pay for other things, you are defined as poor, which means that you can't meet your basic needs. If a four-person household is depending on that one income of a person earning minimum wage, that person is subsisting on $62.50 a week, which is less than half the poverty line. So that even with two people working for minimum wage in that house, that household is still poor. So sir, all the proposed rate is doing is saying, well, good Lord, as my mother would say, could they? We set up a minimum wage in 2012. We never adjusted it for inflation. We never adjusted it for the change in prices. All we are seeking to do is to say that to remain even, to be able to buy today what your minimum wage was able to buy you in 2012, it needs an increase. Now, sir, when we were doing this research, and, and, and I, I have to, I, I don't want to steal the thunder of the member for St. Peter in case he will want to speak on these matters, but with the leadership of his ministry, and with the strong support, I hope you will allow me, sir, to, to, to mention Ambassador Masco. Because, you know, sir, there is an economic team in this country. Not everybody has to be in the spotlight. Not everybody wants to be in the spotlight. Some of us work very easily behind the scenes. We don't need press conferences. 
but the work is being done. So, so I want to say to some of us that when we miss some of our colleagues, and I, I, I understand that the Honorable Leader of the Opposition might miss some of, some of his former colleagues, but we're all still there. We don't all need to be up front and center. But Ambassador Maskell has done tremendous work to be able to work with us to resolve some of these issues. And, 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 and one of the things that we looked at is the fact that the people who are earning minimum wage in Barbados, it's not the teenagers that, that, that other jurisdictions would like, to, like to, 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 to tell you it is. It's not people on a summer job. It is largely many female-headed households who have children to send to school. People between the ages of 20 and 49 working for minimum wage in Barbados. And sir, you know, minimum wages are being practiced all over the world, all over the world. It's not just us. And every time they were introduced or increased or adjusted, businesses expre expressed some kind of apprehension that this minimum wage would erode their profits and would be difficult to do. And, and, and I know that this is a difficult time for both private and public sector. But if it's a difficult time for business, imagine how, what a difficult time it is for households. And so there's always been apprehension that minimum wage would erode profits, but, but here's what we know. That in almost every case, the effect that the minimum wage has had, has been shown to have, is to support the economy by getting money into people's pockets, which they then spend not just on those same businesses, but also on the education and on the health of their households. And why is that important? Because those investments in health, in education, in the same private sector businesses that had reluctance about paying the minimum wage, then also help to reproduce a labor force for those same businesses. If I'm not sending school my children, if I'm not feeding my children, if I am not reproducing the labor force, what labor force is the private sector going to have to draw on today and in the future? Sometimes we think in these siloed ways, and I feel as if we do not always fully appreciate the interconnected nature of these different sectors of the economy. If we did not have people being able to support themselves and their families, there would be no human capital base on which the private sector could build its business, to grow its business, to improve their profits. And so if I wanted to look, as Ambassador Maskell and I did, when we were supporting the Honorable Member for St. Peter in this work, if I wanted to look at how minimum wage would have increased if it were keeping pace with the increases in managerial salaries, then we would be having a whole different conversation. Because it would be much higher. So it's, it feels to me, and the reason I felt compelled to speak on this, sir, even though there's so many more points that I will have to make in my short time this morning, is that it seems as if there are some who would have us abandon any attempt to make sure that people's work pays them enough to keep them above the poverty level. Well, I would say that this is a basic function that work should fulfill. If I work, The salary that I make from my work, the income that I make from my work should at least be enough to keep me above the poverty level. I don't think that is a hard ask. But instead we are focusing on these notions of productivity and efficiency which are important. But let me say this, what determines a worker's productivity? Surely it includes whether they can feed themselves. Surely it includes whether they can give themselves and their families nutritious food, see the doctor when they're sick, send their children safely to school. A person who cannot do all those things is not going to be productive. So I feel, sir, and we said it in June 2018, when we had a different crisis to confront, that the time has come for us to stop sacrificing workers on the altar of business efficiency and profits. Mm -hmm. 
The last three years have shown us that the two can coexist. When we came to the social partnership, and we came to the people of Barbados, and we talked about the principle of burden sharing, many hands made it like work. We have to do this together. It was not rhetoric. I know some in this honorable chamber regrettably like rhetoric, but it was not rhetoric, it was real. And we watched it work with respect to the economic crisis that we faced when we came to service in May 2018. We watched it work. So why have we abandoned, it seems, the idea that this burden sharing can continue to work? Mr. Speaker, sir, we have said, and I will repeat it in this honorable chamber, all must live in this country, and all will live if these estimates of expenditure and revenue have anything to do with it, that is one of the key principles on which these estimates are built. And, and, and I, I want to emphasize that this burden sharing is about rights, but it is also about responsibilities. Mm -hmm. It is not to absolve us of the responsibility to be productive. Workers have a responsibility to produce. But they also have a right to be able to survive as a result of that productivity and as a, as a result of their productive capacity. So, sir, on the matter of, of, of the responsibility to produce and having the wherewithal to produce, sir, I want to come to another part of the three things that these estimates are based on, and that has to do with implementation and doing business. I spoke earlier, sir, about the fact that this COVID-19 pandemic has taught us many lessons. And one of the things that we have said in many spaces, in many fora, is that this may sound like strange language, but we have an opportunity, sir, to win the recovery. These estimates, sir, are about winning the recovery, why do I use language like that? Because in fact, this is a fight. This is a battle. And there are some countries that regrettably may not be in a position where they win the recovery because they may, start, they may end up farther back than they started. Barbados has a unique opportunity to win this recovery. We have an opportunity through or vaccine vaccination strategy, which has seen over 25% of the population being vaccinated so far. We have an opportunity, and you know, I, I said it before, that I am all for economic diversification. It has to happen, it must happen. I'm not gonna go over all the ways it will happen because the Honorable Prime Minister mentioned many of them in her, um, in her intervention yesterday. But let us not fool ourselves. If we are not to see in this financial year a further erosion of the revenue base of government, we have to get the hotel and tourism sector back up and running again. Let us not fool ourselves. We have to be able to walk and chew gum. Just because you continue to invest in a diversified tourism sector, does not mean that you cannot diversify other parts of your economy. And we've spoken over and over about, about what a new visiting economy must look like because other members in this chamber will, will tell you, sir, that I don't even say tourism sector anymore. I use the language of visitor economy because that's what it is. We are not looking for a sun, sea, and sand model anymore. The fact that we're looking at educational and, and medical services for visitors, the fact that we're looking at a uh, uh, new population policy and immigration bill to look at how we can have people here living, investing, working, volunteering, living their lives in a way that contributes to the economy means that we are talking about a new visit to economy, but we're also talking about diversifying other parts of the economy. That is a given. That, that, that it is not a zero sum game. But let us not fool ourselves that in this year of our Lord, we have 
to make sure that we have the hotel sector up and running again because of the 40% of Barbadian workers who were in that sector. It does not make any sense to sit down and fold your arms and say, yeah, one-legged economy that's all about tourism and watch 40% of workers struggle and sit home, sit down home with nothing to do. You know, whenever I was about to do something foolhardy and I tell my mother, yeah, you're doing this, she would say, all right, you go now. Because she's going to watch me and have me come back with the lessons to tell about why that is not a good idea. But the burden of government does not allow you to experiment with people's lives in that way. And so winning the recovery is also going to mean investing in a new visitor economy and making sure that those hotels are up and running again. We have to do it in this financial year while we diversify other parts of the economy. But winning the recovery, sir, is also about making sure that we improve doing business, improve competitive, competitiveness, improve implementation and execution, and in so doing, create a platform for innovation. During this crisis, sir, what emerged very, very quickly was an online and a delivery economy that was able to emerge because of a lot of the work that has been done in the background by this government on doing business. And again, we couldn't do it overnight. We haven't finished it all. But we are a ways from where we started two and a half to three years ago. In, 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 in having a national payment system, in doing reforms to Kaipo, in making sure that there's more that people can do online, in making sure that businesses, businesses started in the context of a pandemic as part of a delivery economy. There were some places where you could only go and buy and pick up food. Quick, so all of a sudden, you saw a fleet of cars on the road. You, could, you, you couldn't leave your house without seeing one of them delivering from a certain fast food chain. We did not buckle as an economy, as a country, sir, under COVID. We did not buckle, we invented. And we were able to do that, and we will be able to continue to do that because we are investing, and it's not a lot. We talk about not just being a tax and spend government like the last administration, it is not a lot. Sometimes it is about elbow grease. It is about consultation. It's about working with the private sector to figure out what is not working and how to get it working again. But sir, we have to go further. We have to go further. And the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Investment is going further because as the Honorable Member of St. Michael Northeast alluded to yesterday, we are going to have to do the work of establishing a delivery unit in the ministry that makes sure that these important projects in the public sector investment program, that these important parts of the doing business agenda, like making sure we continue the reforms in town planning and all the other parts of it, that to make sure that these things work. So we have an enterprise growth fund limited in the ministry that is a part of the ministry. And we have done a lot of work to be able to examine what EGFL is delivering and to make sure that it can deliver better for small businesses in this country. We had a, a credit guarantee facility at the central bank that we are now doing for a second time. But what is changing about that facility? It used to be that businesses would go to banks and banks would say, commercial banks and banks would say, no, 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 I don't like this. This looks a little bit risky. I want a guarantee for this. And that was what that credit guarantee fund did. What we've done in the second iteration is to expand the number of financial institutions that get to make decisions about who qualifies for the guarantee. Let me say what that means. It means that not just commercial banks get to make decisions about who's credit worthy. It means that other agencies that have perhaps a different approach to fostering small business, now get to work with small business, now get to have an incubator and accelerator component for small business, 
So that is not just about saying you don't qualify for this. Sorry. It is about true facilitation. And that is what these estimates are also supporting. That we will see a restructured EGFL that is able to deliver more for people. The sir. Member has two more minutes. Thank you, sir. In my closing, I, I, I want to say this. Much has been made about the investment portfolio, the private sector investment works. And we see that Sajikor, um, the Sajikor project is still going ahead. We know that there are other projects that are still going ahead. But the truth is that the reason I talk about having a frank conversation, an honest conversation with the country, is that you have to be able to say, as the Honorable Prime Minister said yesterday, when something, when you are taking a new direction, because you are waiting for private sector projects to have a sure footing in the context of the pandemic. There are no secrets, sir. We will always say what is going and what is not going, what is proceeding and what is not proceeding. That is the reason that the public sector investment program is so important. And before I hear in the future about how we shouldn't be investing more to deliver projects. Let me say this, that the price that you pay for failing to get these key projects off the ground so people can work again is a much, much higher price than any investment that you can make in getting implementation done. Sir, I am never one to believe that a government should pat itself on the back. I am always one to admit where there are improvements to be made. But sir, I feel proud of what this economic team, officials in finance, officials in the Ministry of Innovation, I'm talking about all the people that are part of the Estimates Committee, officials in Economic Affairs and Investment, officials in the Ministry of Public Service, all of my colleagues, sir, in this honorable place and that other place, I feel proud of what these estimates represent philosophically and practically for the people of Barbados. And we're not finished because we come and lay a document in here. Every day we get up to be able to make sure that what is in these books is delivered so people can have a better life. And that is the commitment that we continue to make. And with these few words, sir, I commend this appropriation bill to the House. Honourable Member for St. Michael's South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, sir. I do not intend to detain the House unnecessarily long, sir. I do wish, sir, to add my voice in support of these estimates, sir, because I believe that these are as relevant and as necessary for these times as could possibly be. I listened yesterday, sir, to the presentation made by the Honourable Prime Minister and the presentation made by my friend, the Leader of the Opposition, and of course, the one made by the member for St. James Central and just now, sir, the brilliant presentation made by my colleague and neighbor, St. Michael South Central. I listen when I come to this place, sir, because I never take it for granted that I'm here. And I have taken a commitment that when there are things with which I don't necessarily agree, that I should lean in more to be curious about the positions that I probably don't necessarily agree with, to see if I could learn something and gain perhaps a perspective. And indeed, sir, it was actually the Honorable Leader of the Opposition who spoke to me one evening after Parliament and suggested that perhaps I frame my conversations in such a way as to add value to the discourse um, as I proceeded in this Parliament, sir. I, I would therefore wish to offer him the same advice that he gave me. Um, Mr. Speaker, sir, I, I want to take this opportunity to, to say to the public of Barbados that we obviously knew when we came into Parliament that we had a very difficult and long, perhaps, protracted experience in trying to deliver Barbados. We knew, sir, that we were facing a number of challenges, particularly financial challenges, 
But we came in with a commitment, sir, on climate change. And I heard the leader, the honorable member for St. Michael South Central just say that perhaps people are thinking things that we're saying now have become cliche. We're talking about, we're talking about doing ease of doing business, sir. We talk about climate change all the time, and people perhaps think it's cliche now. But it, perhaps it's cliche only because it's simple truth is leading to its constant repetition. And that we are saying it in the hope that Barbadians fully grasp it in relation to what it is that we are, we are dealing with. But sir, we, we, today, for example, in, in today's paper, you see the sargasm seaweed in St. Lucie. Mm, that, sir, is a, a consequence of climate change. We know, sir, that we are grappling with hurricanes that Caribbean people never had to grapple with every single year, sir, a consequence of climate change. And some of the hard conversations that we are now having with our own people in relation to how you should fish and where you shouldn't fish there and so on, sir. Things that we never had to deal with, sir. We're now dealing with as a government, sir. And we do that in an overall macro context, sir. That is difficult at best. No fiscal space. I mean, high burdensome debt, declining population. Sir, these are difficult times. And I, I don't feel, sir, that any of us have to try to go and convince any Barbadian that these are difficult times. I mean, it is clear for all to see. But, you know, but sometimes even in the clearance of information, you still have to raise your hand, sir, and show people the holes so that they too, like Thomas, would believe. But these, sir, are very, very difficult times for all of us, and I know that all of my colleagues, like myself, have been out to the baller. Everybody out to the baller. Working, working, working. We meet, sir, morning to night, Sundays, Saturdays, weekends, you know, sir. Weekends make no difference. All of us, sir, giving 150% as we attempt to move forward, sir, and to move this country forward. We bit the bullet. And, and the Prime Minister said it yesterday. We suspended that. We, we, we tried to restructure our commitments. We, we entered into an agreement with the IMF, an agreement that was criticized, sir. But it's because of that simple practice, sir, that most of us now find ourselves in a position where we are able now to be able to deliver to the poorest poor in this country, sir. And that, sir, you know, sometimes people can not necessarily be accused of being malicious, but they can legitimately be accused of being short-sighted. And, and perhaps, sir, that is the burden, sir, that we have now to help some of our people now be, be eased of, because we have to explain to Barbadians the reality of, of the circumstances that we came in and we found, and the measures that we are taking to relieve the pressures on Barbadians, sir. But I, as, as all of us, sir, I felt that Barbados was doing well. <laughs> you know, I, as I was thinking, as I was saying, Barbados was doing it and doing it and doing it well. And, and unfortunately, sir, things happen. Shift happens, you know. We have to shift things. Shift happens. And, and you know, the, the reality is it's not the fittest that survive, sir, but it's those who adapt that survive. And Barbados had to make some adaptations, sir. I believe that we did so and that we did so well. And as I listened yesterday, sir, I, I realized Barbados went on a series of journeys. And I, I really intend to be brief. The first journey, sir, was as we came in in 2018, what, what I call the journey into the wild, when we came in and, and it was like, you know, this crazy last 10 years of trying to clear a mess. And I remember even then, sir, a principled government took a principled position that Barbadians had to have breakfast before they went on a long journey. So that even in the face of a difficult conversation with an IMF institution, sir, that sometimes is rooted in its own values, Thankfully, over the last few years, it is evolving. But even in the face of a difficult conversation led by our principles, we determined that Barbadians had to eat first. And a series of benefits for Barbadians came thereafter, including a pay increase, sir. The second journey, sir, was what in 2019, when all of us started planning for the gathering, the gathering, sir, what I, what I call the journey home. And I remember, sir, I traveled then with the Prime Minister across. We went to Canada. We were in the U.S., sir, talking to Barbadians about coming home and, and, and just the, the excitement of people coming home. And I also remember, sir, on that trip, sir, the conversations that we had at the time with persons in the banking sector, the international banking sector. Difficult conversations, sir. Yet Barbadians were very pleased about the idea of coming home. And I felt, sir, sometimes listening to the Prime Minister as I learned, as I said to you, sir, I spent, I tried to learn every single day, sir. And I listen, sir, the principled position all the time in every conversation. 
as we tried, sir, to convince Barbadians to come home, but to make sure that this home, sir, was the same home that they recognized and that they understood prior to 2008, sir. The third journey, sir, that I think of, sir, was at the beginning of 2020. And I call this journey, sir, the journey into who we are. And this is in the most difficult of circumstances, sir, that people expose who they are, my view. And that when times get tough, you see people running. And, you know, for those of us who are in our own clothes, you know, I hope the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, he may know this here, of course. He's, you know, he's a man just like myself in many ways. When you're ironing your clothes and you put in a seam that you shouldn't put in, what they call the, the mock seam, and you put the heat on it, you got two seams. The one that ain't supposed to be there disappear quick because it cannot take the heat, sir. In, in, in circumstances where there is a little bit of pressure, people show who they are. Those who are not supposed to be there will scatter. And those, those who are supposed to be there will stay and will do what they're supposed to do. And it, it's my understanding, sir, that in this journey into who we are, sir, we explained as we began, sir, that as a part of who we are, sir, we would never face a crisis and leave the poorest poor behind. And if there was a time that I was proud of the government, sir, and I've been proud of this government, and that's the truth, it is the position that we took, sir, as it related to the poor and the vulnerable, sir, even as we were dealing with COVID. I find it almost appalling for anybody right thinking to suggest that this government did not take care of the poor as best as it could, sir, during the most difficult periods of COVID. You know, I, I remember, sir, that even before people were dealing with COVID, people can get back the, the income tax. There was no reverse tax credit. I mean, it was, but we did that. And sir, we came in, sir, and you know, if you wanna, because things are good for you and people forget, but the idea of getting food, sir, is a big deal. If you are a business person, sir, and your business has been closed and you are being given money to help you get through, that's much people ain't doing it. I have friends, sir, who live in New Zealand, and New Zealand is handling COVID better than most, but they're complaining, sir, because of, of being closed down so long and not having access to any financial support. Sir, it is difficult business, and the, the approach that we took, sir, I am very, very proud of, sir. The last and final journey is what I now call the journey into the future, because we have, sir, to recognize that even as we deal with all these things, we still have to go somewhere, and Barbados, believe it, or not, or for those who would try to stay where or not, or those who would try to stifle where we are going, sir, we are going somewhere, sir, as is the tone that Barbados has always found for itself, sir. And yesterday, the Honorable Prime Minister said that Barbados has to be world class by 2027. And that is not a new thing. She said so when we were in opposition. She said so when we came into office, sir. And despite all of the difficult circumstances that we have now found, and I like the term used by the Honorable Member for St. Michael's uh, South Central, that we're going to win this. Despite all these difficult circumstances that we found, sir, we are, we are bent, our minds set to task and to purpose, sir, that we are going to win this. And, 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 and sir, what does that mean for a country like Barbados? And all of us, every single member with a ministry, sir, will tell you of the things that they are doing, sir, to make sure that we win this, to make sure that Barbados becomes first class. I look forward to hearing the Honorable, Lead, the Honorable Member for St. Philip South when he speaks, because I know he's doing transformative things in agriculture. And, and, and therefore, I look forward to the presentation that he makes, even as we work together to prepare to be able to export to the European Union. But that there are some things, sir, that this country is doing, sir, that I, I, I believe that I'm very proud of. And I will speak only very briefly, sir, about maritime, because every minister in here can speak very clearly and at length, if they chose to, about the things they're doing. We choose, sir, to be a little more succinct than others who went before me. <laughs> but Mr. Speaker, sir, in my time, what are we doing, sir? And for consistency, I want to keep the, 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 the terms that the Honorable Prime Minister used yesterday, sir. Prime Minister said, sir, there were tr three areas that we had to focus on. One, she said, protect those who were struggling and that the government had a responsibility so to do. And in the space that I have responsibility for, sir, the the persons who are responsible, who are fishing and vending in the, in, the, in the market, sir. You would appreciate that this obviously has not been an easy task. And we, at the announcement of the second close down, sir, the second pause, we asked persons to come home. 
We said, is your added interest to come? We never said you had to come home. But those who came home, so we gave them back what they spent. We said, okay, you, you put up money for ice, we can give you back the ice. Vendors, sir, as you know, are benefiting from the 250 that everybody else is benefiting from. We were having conversations prior to COVID about raising the fees in the market because right now it is only 75 cents. And we were having 75 cents a day. Where else was getting kind of rates, sir? So we were having a conversation about raising the rates, but of course, because of COVID, we said, no, we're not going to raise any rates on anybody at this moment, sir. Mind you, the raise and the increase came from the vendors themselves. So they understand, sir, that they too want to make a contribution to this country. And I commend the vendors, sir, because people are always criticizing and saying they can't and they can't. And it was the vendors who said we need to pay more per day for use of the market, sir. But, sir, we continue to protect the, the, the vendors. And then, sir, unlike any other country that I know of, that I know of, we prioritize for vaccines fisher folk, so that our fisher folk were deemed as an essential part of the Barbadian landscape, sir, and were given priority for vaccinations. Now, where else has that happened, sir? And people normally look down on this class, sir, but in conversation with the Honorable Prime Minister and the Attorney General, sir, and the, the team, sir, in health, we determined that the fisher folk were an essential service and prioritized them for vaccination. So that when the country opened back, sir, they, because they go out for two weeks, sometimes three weeks, sir, they then would find themselves in a position where they can continue to be part of the productive sector, sir, in this country. And I, I want, sir, to commend the fisher folk, sir, and those are just some of the simple things that we did for them. I won't go on, sir. But of course, I could talk about the, the, the tremendous work that we've done across the various markets. But, sir, the Honorable Prime Minister also spoke to, sir, about Point number two, public sector-led growth through, through capital expenditure. And again, all of us ministries that have some capital expenditure, sir, we know that we've been driven, sir, to deliver on this because this is one way to kickstart the economy. And in a real way, sir, it puts money into the pockets of people. And so we've been focusing very hard, sir, on delivering for those public sector capital projects, sir, because they're important. The PM spoke yesterday, too, about the debt swap, and I won't get into it, but it would have been a good thing. But the reality is that Barbados performs so well. Let me tell you how this works in general terms. Huh? In general terms, a country that is issuing bonds or whatever, sir, finds itself, sir, normally under stress. So people would say to themselves, oh, that's $100 that he got for me, but I don't feel he can get my $100, so I'm going to take $85 from a man and let a man deal with he and get back he $100. But I'm going to be good with $85. That's how it works. And then the $15, sir, in the debt swap, sir, the person take out a little something, and then the rest of that money, sir, is made available back to us. So that we would have had a lot of extra money, sir, back into Barbados to do a lot of things in the marine space. But the trouble came, thankfully, is that the country performs so well, sir. When people expected our debt to trade at 85 cents and 75 cents to the dollar, yesterday when I checked, I was about to check this morning, but yesterday when I checked, we were trading at a, a above par. It was a dollar and a cent, or a dollar and two cents yesterday, sir. So people were paying more per dollar, sir, than the 85 cents that we had imagined when we first started this journey. And that is all testimony to the wonderful leadership of the Prime Minister of this country and the economic team. So, so we have to understand it, sir, in that context, because Barbadians probably don't fully appreciate what was done. So that the people who are working with us to do this thing are all on it. Well, we've never seen this. We've never seen this. All the way treat to this. And now I'm working with the Honorable Member here, sir, for St. Michael South Central again for finding ways now, innovative financial mechanisms, sir, to finance the blue economy space. And, sir, we are doing work across all the markets, sir. In the middle of COVID, when times are hard, sir, we came to this parliament, sir, and we agreed for additional funds to fix Oystin's jetty, sir at $2.5 million. We are doing work, sir, in Bridgetown, sir. The total work will come to $3.6 million, sir, to repair all the jetties in, in Bridgetown. And in the middle of COVID, when times are hard, sir, we are not shirking from our responsibility. We are doing what we have to do for the poor and the vulnerable, sir, and the working class in this country. And I'm telling you, sir, that we could go across every single ministry, not only mine, sir, and find that work is being done to protect the poor and needy in this country, to protect the vulnerable, sir, in this country. When your honorable member for St. Thomas speaks, I'm sure she'll speak to the number of things we're doing for the most indigent in Barbados, sir. And those are some of the things that we've done. We also 
We, we, we started putting out fish aggregating devices. They're called fads, and they're just something that attract fish. So that fishermen would know they could go here sir, and catch fish and so on and so forth at a million dollars. And we're putting on that, sir, smart technology, sir, so that not only are we catching, uh, the fishermen catch fish, but we can see, sir, the kind of fish that's in the area. We get an idea of the temperature of the water. We get an idea of the wave energy, sir. So it's smart technology, the first in Barbados, and the kind of smart technology, sir, that's the first in the Caribbean. We came to office to lead. And that COVID has not stopped us from being able to lead. And, sir, we're seeing that transformation also in, in the markets. And then lastly, sir, the third point the PM raised, and I'm keeping the same point, sir, was that we have to make it simpler to do business. Now, if there is a place where it has to be simpler to do business, sir, it has to be the British Town Port. The British Town Port, sir, in the trading across borders, sir, which is part of the doing business in that, sir. The overall trading across borders, sir, Barbados was 129 the last time, uh, in, I think out of 180 countries, 190 countries, we were 129, sir, overall. In trading across borders, which includes now your ports and so on, we were 132. We were worse off, sir. And there are real reasons for that. Because the port, sir, of Bridgetown and the whole entire legislative framework for shipping, sir, was so far behind. I, sir, in shipping, sir, we are changing all of the legislation, all. We're now bringing it into the modern era, sir. In 2018, when we were audited by the International Maritime Organization, Barbados failed in a number of areas. And sir, we are therefore changing the legislation daily, piece by piece by piece. And very soon, sir, you're gonna see in this, in this honorable place, the facilitation legislation, which allows uh, better technology to be used in the, in the port. You're gonna see the domestic shipping legislation, which has also been changed, sir. I see fairest legislation, sir, which we are now finalizing, sir. The honorable member for St. Peter gave me his green light, sir, and comments on that paper, sir. That should come to cabinet this week, sir. But that legislation will allow us, sir, to protect our seafarers. But more importantly, what that legislation does is that it allows us to put our pos ourselves in a position for the sh cruise ships and cargo ships, sir, to hire more Barbadians, sir. And we're enshrining in our legislation, sir, what is called the STCW codes, which allows us, sir, to certify people to be trained. Because back in the day, you could just go and get on the ship, you walk down by the harbor, a man short, you get on Those days are gone. You don't need to be trained up, sir, and to be certified. And we found, sir, that most countries across the world, sir, that have training institutions, sir, haven't been as responsive, and we're doing it ourselves, sir. So very soon, and then you're going to be hearing very soon, sir, announcements between ourselves and cruise ships about the way they want to engage Barbadians. And I will say here, sir, when, when the announcement is made for Barbadians to start picking up this training, that they should do so, sir, because there are going to be significant employment opportunities in the cruise sector very, very soon. And I will say more about that another time, Mr. Speaker, sir. But we also, sir, said that in terms of the time it takes to get cargo out of the port, sir, it was taking Barbados 10 days, 11 days, 12 days on average to clear cargo out of the port. It is madness, sir, in a sophisticated country or a country that claims or aspires to be sophisticated. We've reduced that, sir, now from 10, 11 days to 5, 6 days, sir. And I've told the port, and we're working on it, sir, to, re to reduce that, sir, to three days, sir, so that by the time we go back to the people, what would have taken 11 days is going to be taking three days, sir. We're going to become a lot more efficient. So there were simple things, too. We also wanted for the other agencies, other government agencies, the port, customs, health, agriculture, sir, to work together to clear cargo. You know, it, it was, sir, that you would come to the port, you get your thing done, you go into customs, you then go to agriculture, you go to... Port. It was like this kind of madness. It, it defies logic that such a system could be allowed to stand unchallenged, undisturbed for so long, sir. So we've now changed that, sir. We have a group, sir, they work together, sir, to be able to expedite cargo, sir, and it works well. Ask anybody in the business community, sir. We also now have to look, sir, in the port and, and, and the associated agencies about the, the, the opening time. The port opens at 7, another agency starts at 8, one starts at 8.30, sir. So we're now having a conversation. Of course, this involves the union because, you know, once you start meddling with public service, service time is a conversation with the union for sure. And we've been very respectful of the union. So we're having that conversation, sir, about being able to open at a proper time, probably earlier, so that we could facilitate more business. So the ease of doing business must never just be cliché. If you want to be a first-class nation, sir, you have to have first-class principles, first-class execution and implementation, sir, and a first-class reputation, because a reputation brings more business, sir. 
And so, so those are some of the simple things that we are doing overall in the port. I could go on, sir, but I promise my colleagues, sir, there's a, that, that there are lots of people who I want to share what the government is doing, sir. But those are just some of the simple things that we are doing in the maritime space, sir, in a time of COVID, for the most uh, challenge, sir, for the people whose finances, sir, are, are difficult and who are having a hard time of it, sir. I want to close by reminding this chamber, sir, that all of us, sir, we have constituents. And I don't think there's a single member in here who forgets it. I know every day that I represent St. Michael South, sir. I am sure you know every day that you represent St. Michael Central. The leader of the opposition represents St. Michael West Central, and he does so well because he's always asking St. Michael West, sorry, because he's always asking for benefits for St. Michael West. And because we represent people, we know that we're in conversation with them. We are not so estranged from our public, sir. So it, it would be impossible for me to imagine and to accept that any of us come in here, sir, on a daily basis and do things that are contrary to the people who sent us here, to the benefit of the people who sent us here, sir. I know what I do, sir, is for the people in St. Michael South Central every day. South, every day, almost, I said South Central, sir. I'm getting too close to the Honorable uh, Member for St. Michael South Central. We share a border. But I do things for the people in St. Michael South every day, sir. And my people, sir, are the same people, sir. They're carpenters, they're hairdressers, sir. I have, because of where I'm located, a number of people who work in the hotel industry, sir. So when we scoff at the hotel industry, sir, and say, well, this is this one-legged horse and a one-trick pony and all these various things, sir, I am talking about hundreds of people in my constituency, sir, who need those hotels to function. I am talking about plumbers who go to work, sir, and make sure that the toilet's still working because you won't close down a hotel because you ain't got a big band of tourists. And then when the tourists come, the, the toilets don't work. The pool got mold. The rooms ain't clean. So when they come now, you don't find yourself with a massive bill and infrastructure that does not work, sir. I mean, we have to be ahead of the game, sir. And sir, these are the simple things that we are doing. I wish to close by commending this, this wonderful set of estimates to the House, sir. I support it fully, sir. And if we all stay the course, Mr. Speaker, sir, I suspect we're going to ensure a brighter future for all of us. Thank you, sir. I remember St. Philip South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let me first start by giving thanks to the people of St. Philip South for reposing their confidence in me and giving me the chance to support this Appropriation Bill 2021. This will be the third Appropriation Bill debate that I would have participated in since my journey to this Honorable Chamber. And Mr. Speaker, I am indeed pleased to note that I am one part of a government that has done extremely well in the most difficult of circumstances. I have heard about many administrations, successes and failures, but I've never dreamt of the day coming when I will be part of an administration that has to grapple with a global pandemic, challenging us to the core, but yet still we're able to deliver for the people of Barbados. And I can only echo the words of several others who have said they are happy that we are the government now and not the previous administration. And all that we've done is demonstrative of the commitment, the hard work, the serious approach to governance, and indeed the war cabinet that we continue to run in order for us to be able to be nimble and work on the behalf of the people of Barbados. Mr. Speaker, sir, it is against that backdrop but I'm completely disappointed to listen to the presentation yesterday of the Honorable Member for St. Michael West, which to my mind was only an expose and sententious bombast 
And it is patently clear to me that with the late Professor Owen Seymour Arthur gone, there was no one available to prepare his response. So therefore, he was only able to deliver what I would consider to be nothing short of an evil creed in this honorable chamber. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank him though for drawing the public's attention to the sector in which I have been given responsibility for. And I also want to thank him for reminding the public that there are several achievements in agriculture that they should be talking about more and more every day rather than the sententious, salacious stuff that we are hearing promoted by those with their own hidden agendas. I must thank the honorable member for bringing that into perspective and letting the public of Barbados know that we have better things in agriculture to talk about. And what do I mean, Mr. Speaker, sir? I mean that we've constantly been focusing on a conversation about food and pork bill, and I've said this in this honorable chamber before. But whilst we are doing so, we are failing to, to accept the fact that there are several things that come in on that bill that we deliberately ignore and behave as though Barbados produced those things. And in time coming, like Crazy said, in time to come, they may happen, but we, we, we got things on our food and pork bill like wines and all kinds of liquors and spirits. We have all kinds of uh, teas and coffee and I can go on and on and on with condiments, etc. Things that we are currently not producing in Barbados that make up the majority of the food and pork bill. But yet responsible people who want to address this issue will seek to mislead the public and make it seem as though that is only primary agriculture. And I forgive those who don't understand. But I do not forgive anyone who comes to this honorable chamber without proper research because we are here to work on the behalf of the people of Barbados and the one thing we must do is proper research. So that if that was done, we would have known that the food import bill is, is probably just over 300 million and not 700 million. That food import bill represents fruits and vegetables in primary agriculture. That is food import bill for me. All the others, we will get there. But you know that we have been talking about agriculture and talking the talk but not walking the walk. I have come to this ministry and I've recognized that for decades, many things that could have been achieved are only being flagged now. And Mr. Speaker, sir, I speak to drought conditions and climate change, where we knew long ago that we were going to get prolonged drought conditions. And when we don't get prolonged drought conditions, we're going to get floods. But did we take measures to protect the farmers back then? What I am doing now in preparing a water augmentation program at River and St. Philip and repealing the Tree Houses Spring Act, which is approximately 300 years old, and making sure that the farmers at St. Philip, at River and St. Philip, will get a continuous supply of water rather than floods, because by dint of the name, you should start to understand what it means. This was never even flagged, Mr. Speaker, sir. Spring Hall in St. Lucie, where my ministerial colleague, the Honorable Member for St. Lucie lives. They are also getting water support in Spring Hall in St. Lucie, where the farmers on the Spring Hall land lease project have been complaining. As a matter of fact, I am happy to report to you that we are going to simultaneously start the clearing of wells at Spring Hall so that they can get water in St. Lucie, whilst we're working on the project at River and St. Philip. 
Now, I am cognizant of the fact that I don't have all day, but I have said before in this honorable chamber, and I will repeat, that I look forward to the day when I can stand here and give a full and wholesome presentation on agriculture, and that day is coming, sir. Mr. Speaker, this ministry, in honoring our commitment to the people of Barbados, started a medicinal cannabis industry, a new sector, an industry that is going to stand head and shoulders with our tourism sector. Mr. Speaker, this industry is a billion dollars industry. Last year's projections were somewhere around 79 billion US dollars. This is nothing to scoff at. But we, in this government, gave Barbados a medicinal cannabis industry in less than three years. Now I want to thank the Honorable Leader of Her Majesty Opposition for recognizing that this is something that we need to talk about and for recognizing that we need to continue to let the people of Barbados know what a great job we are doing in agriculture on their behalf. Mr. Speaker, at the medicinal cannabis industry, and I want to compliment the team there, and I should really pause and thank the CEO and her board, but the CEO took up office for this industry and sat with me and sat with her colleagues and worked assiduously to make sure we get our regulations sorted and to make sure, Mr. Speaker, sir, that we bring along people with us to the point that when we launched on January 18th, we were starting to receive applications at pace. To date, and I hope the honorable member for St. Michael West is listening, we have 45 draft applications. What is a draft application? application sorry it means you've expressed an interest you want to know more so you're talking to the cannabis licensing authority with a view to applying for a license 45 we have two license two applications that were submitted not approved but the persons have had all the questions answered they're comfortable that this is what they want to do, and they want to go to the due diligence process. And we've allocated four months for the due diligence process. So if we started in January, February we were in a national pause, so we could not have dealt with applications because the Cannabis Authority was closed. People were working from home. And this is March, where we've just started to come out. So we don't have a four months period yet where we can say the due diligence was done and so a license was issued. But Mr. Speaker, sir, you know what Lion is? Lion is giving some information while believing it not to be true, but introducing it to deceive by so doing. That, to my mind, Mr. Speaker, represents how people can drop to an all-time low in order to score, to my mind, it's their own goal, because it is so far away from the truth that the reality of it does not even start to surface. But, Mr. Speaker, I am particularly disappointed as well to know that I stand in this honorable house on a point of order to correct what I thought was a genuine misunderstanding, yet the matter was pursued. And I ask all Barbadians, I ask all Barbadians to determine what is a suitable fit for political parties in Barbados and who you would prefer to govern because this is a governance issue. And when you start by seeking to mislead and deceive people, then you must understand 
that Barbados will find itself in a place where deception will be at the core of indulgence. Mr. Speaker, our sugar industry, an industry that needed a transitioning process where Barbadians, ordinary Barbadians, would get a chance to participate, not just as laborers, not just being in the sun, having to resort to the bush when nature calls, but that they would participate in ownership and have the convenience of going to a bathroom and a lunchroom to sit down at lunch break, Mr. Speaker, sir. And that this ministry has no place on order 10 state-of-the-art units. And they would have been here were it not for the shutdown period between December and a couple weeks ago. So that our laborers on our farms can have bathroom facilities, lunch rooms, Mr. Speaker, sir. And don't have to resort to the bush when nature calls. And what we have determined with the Barbados Workers Union and the union with the interests of the sugar workers as well, CISA, that until those bathrooms are delivered, chemical toilets must be across all of the farms where they're working. Drive around Barbados now and see. This is what we do, Mr. Speaker, sir. And we have given Barbadians a commitment and we are standing by it. Mr. Speaker, the sugar harvest. I admit we have an old factory at Portville and that's being addressed. We projected by paying the farmers on time. When I took up office as minister, we had payments outstanding for farmers over a year, some over two years. And I determined that this could not be the way to work with people. And the cabinet of which I am a part and a prime minister that has determined that we would do right by the people of Barbados said this can't happen anymore. And we have paid up all of the arrears to the farmers and their current payments are on track. Seven million dollars in supplementary was allocated for the start of this sugar harvest so that the farmers can start and we won't have downtime with people complaining possible strikes too. And we were able to get $7 million to start the crop because you can't start receiving the people canes and at the end of a week or two weeks you haven't got the money to pay them but you expect them to continue to pay staff and supply. And we have determined that we wouldn't do this to Barbadians. And we've kept our word, Mr. Speaker, sir. We are now changing the sugar industry to one of Barbadian ownership. And when I say Barbadian ownership, I don't mean a government burden and using taxpayers' money to prop up an industry. I'm talking about the integrated process where the laborers will have an opportunity to purchase shares in a new company that is being created. And where the farmers themselves will have to take ownership in it as well. And then the government would take a small ownership in it. And up to yesterday, I met with the BAMC and the private farmers, BSIL, and those who are not members of BSIL. They have a company called Grow Energy. And they want to get into the space to produce syrup and produce biomass as well to be part of the renewable energy transformation that is coming to Barbados. And Mr. Speaker, we are at the point of creating space at Buckley for Grow Energy and the BAMC to enter into an arrangement where the two can work together and create synergies with King Grass and Sugar Cane so that you have two rotations and we're looking for consistency in supply so that you can do energy going the full value chain Full value chain meaning from cane to molasses or syrup to sugar to renewable energy to fertilizers. And the meeting was extremely cordial. And we are making progress. 
and a commitment that the cabinet gave to us to make sure we transition and come up with a business plan that makes possible for our private sector to participate. And that's where we are going. So we're going to have renewable energy, we're going to have sugar, we're going to have molasses, possibly syrup down the road. But more importantly, Mr. Speaker, sir, we have done something that is historic in Barbados. And sometimes I wonder how people miss these things. Traditionally, many of our people were brought from Africa to work as slaves on plantations. Then all of the sugar that was produced was shipped overseas in bulk. And when our preferential tr treatment was taken away, we then had to be exporting sugar in bulk at a loss, huge loss, sometimes more than 50%, sir. And in two years' time, we were able to close that bulk contract and move sugar to be exported in packages so that we are now doing sugar for direct consumption rather than in bulk. We have not reached the point of profitability with it yet. But we are at the point where if you go in a Winn-Dixie, you're picking up Barbados sugar in a package. Not something that we sent in bulk and come back on a label called Tate and Lyle. And if that's not historic, I don't know what is. I mean, it's a tremendous achievement. I wish that we were at the top end, where we are going to the exclusive market, and we will get there. But for God's sake, we took up a sector that everything was left to lie. Nothing was really happening. And I've said in this honorable chamber before, the focus under the last ministry was about water. And I don't have a problem with that. But you have to bring along the two, because farmers need water. And I have determined also that we are bringing a paper to cabinet to address the water rates as the prime minister spoke yesterday about the disparity in the rates. The paper is already prepared and it's coming to cabinet. Now what we are hoping to do is give the farmers a better deal with water. So in addition to the water augmentation program that we're doing and we're doing it across Barbados, we've got 100 acres of land available to farmers where we're inviting the Rastafarian community of Barbados to come and participate. I've already got 40 acres allocated to two groups. We are working with them to give them all of the inputs that they need, including water. And that, Mr. Speaker, sir, when you speak to how we empower and enfranchise Barbadians across every demographic, you know, we are speaking to a historic movement towards making people a part of what we do whilst we build this economy and give people a piece of the pie, creating the structures in Barbados that we've long been asking for but we're not seeing. And for me to have to come and lay the platform to build those pillars upon which we can deliver the consistency so that we can empower and enfranchise people, sir, I say to you that agriculture is on a different path. So I want to thank the Honorable Member for St. Michael West for inviting Barbadians to follow where it is going. Mr. Speaker, to date, we have invested $3.4 million in equipment at the BAMC alone. 20 new tractors, three of which were delivered this week. This is a government that means business. What is it that challenged us for the past two going three years it was a lack of equipment. We met with the Prime Minister and the Ministry of Finance, and she determined that in order for us to deal with soil degradation, and in order for us to increase production and increase yields in Barbados, she must support the need for equipment. The BAMC just spent $3.4 million in 20 new tractors and implements, sir, to make sure that we can carry out the work in breaking the hard pan in soils 
And this was announced in the throne speech, sir. And it's being done. So that by the, by the end of May, they would have all of the equipment they ordered. Were it not for the shutdown again, they would have had it already. So, Mr. Speaker, now, many small farmers who can't afford to pay for cultivation services can now get cultivation services through the investment government made in equipment. Previously, you will find that people got a piece of land, they want to work it, but they can't make the next step because they can't afford to pay for the cultivation. That is a service we are now giving to those people, sir. And then, Mr. Speaker, we have determined that if we are going to treat the food security in the way that we have to make sure all Barbadians benefit, we created the Farmers Empowerment and Enfranchisement Drive Feed, deliberately acronized that way, and, of course, the Honorable Member for St. Lucie will give you more information. We'll get into more of that. But, well, Mr. Speaker, this is not just about growing food. Because we will reach a point where we got saturation. You got excess supply. Now, last year, when all eyes were on agriculture, we delivered. We didn't run out of food. We didn't have complaints that there were no fruits and vegetables or that we didn't have sweet potatoes in as much as we are challenged with disease in some of these crops and have to find new planting material working with the FAO and working with the Home Agriculture Station. And we have to now put down nurseries. I spoke about this. So that we can do clean planting material for yam, sweet potatoes, cassava. And we've just met with the ambassador of Cuba to be able to increase cassava production and go the full value chain as well, including cassava flour and using the plant as well material to feed animals, sir. Mr. Speaker, we have determined that this cannot stop here and that we have to deal with our trade issues. And the Honorable Member for St. James South will speak to this. But that if we do not have our sanitary or phytosanitary measures in place, we're not creating space for people to look at options beyond Barbados. And that is the reason why the cabinet took a paper from us and agreed that we must proceed. The Prime Minister announced yesterday that she wants the legislation. The legislation is coming. We've already engaged CPC. And we will bring the seven pieces of leg legislation to make that a reality. This is what we do, Mr. Speaker, sir. And then, of course, we've had complaints from farmers over time, you know. Not since I came. Over time. About pretty larceny. And we've looked at the app. We had a meeting last week with CPC. And we've determined that we must add technology. We are going to introduce drones, but not just for pretty larceny. Jones, so that we can do aerial mapping as well. So that we can determine if there's dumping going on, if there's um, soil that we need to zoom in on, and then we can show our cultivation program for all of Barbados to see. So we're going to be using drones. But equally, Mr. Speaker, sir, the issue of traceability must engage our attention. Well, we live in a modern world. And if you're talking about food safety, I went to Alibaba in China. And all I did was I was able to put my mobile phone to a barcode. It told me which farm the food came from, when it was harvested, when it was the best uh, before, uh, best before date, Mr. Speaker. And all that food is tracked from the farm right into retail. Why should we be left out of that? But I mean, the first thing I said to me, I said is this is a no-brainer. And therefore, this is what we're going to do. But if we're doing this, sir, and a person has a certificate or a barcode or whatever you want to call it, for either the purchase at Farmgate, or if the farmer 
is the one that is doing the retail, that we must be able to track this. And that through the Royal Barbados Police Force, where the Prime Minister has already announced that we must have a unit, Mr. Speaker, sir, we are moving ahead now to bring legislation to this parliament to deal with predial larceny, where people will have to actually provide proof of purchase or proof of planting and harvesting. And then, Mr. Speaker, we have also determined that no Barbadian, no Barbadian who wants to participate should be left behind. And therefore, we have determined that there are several communities across Barbados. Some of us may find from time to time that they may get what we call hot. And this is happening because people feel as though they're not under the tent. They've been left out and for many years have been left out, marginalized, and feel that there's a level of deception in the political class where only their vote comes. At our ministry, and I wish to thank my team, Mr. Speaker, for the excellent work they're doing at the Ministry of Agriculture and Food Security, because I have a team of people who commit to working. I don't have the full resources that I would love to have, but none of us do. And we have to make the most of what we have. Sometimes they're under pressure, I understand. But the human service that they have given for the two going three years that I am at the ministry, I really need to thank them. But we've determined that we need a project that would bring along these people and communities. And we sat down, discussed it, and came up with a project called Project Care. Now we've just had care packages all over Barbados, and what were we doing? We were giving out primary agriculture produce. But you always reach a point in time where the government won't be able to continue to pay for that. But on the Project Care, we are helping you now to grow that food in your backyard or in your community. And what will happen is that the same equipment that we just purchased will be used to do the cultivation. And then we will give you the implements as well and the inputs, the seedlings, fertilizers, sprays, spray cans, so that you then can grow your own food in your community or on a piece of land you have in the backyard. And again, I remember the late Owen Arthur who said we have to go back to backyard farming. Now, these are the people we are targeting aren't people who would ordinarily go to the supermarket or to a vendor to buy fresh vegetables. These are people who would eat without fresh vegetables, but that they can now get it on the project here, Mr. Speaker. And that these are people, Mr. Speaker, sir, who we have to bring along because many times, many of them are used to get involved in predator larceny by people who should know better. But if we can empower them and give them a chance, Mr. Speaker, to grow their own food, they have a chance of selling it and don't have to steal in order to make a living. That is what Project Here is designed to do. And I've spoken to the Minister of Finance over and over pleading with him for me to get the support in order for us to deliver this very shortly. Now, Mr. Speaker, I hope the public heard, and I sincerely hope that we all understand that when it comes to food security in Barbados, 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 listen to me carefully, has been selected as the only place in the region to participate in a food security presentation that has been arranged by the OAS. They contacted me yesterday. Their reason? The Zero Hunger Objective 2030 is likely not to be reached 
That is the UN SDG 2, I believe it is. But they have recognized that there are certain jurisdictions that have done well in their approach to food security, and they want them to come to a seminar to present, to show what we are doing in order to reach food security. The last tax I had, when in the Western Hemisphere, you had just over 800 million persons who either suffer from malnutrition or food insecurity. Malnutrition is not when you don't get food only, but it's also when you're forced to eat the wrong type of food and become obese and suffer with NCDs. And Mr. Speaker, we must salute the work in the Ministry of Agriculture when we could be selected to participate at this session to show the rest what we are doing to achieve food security. Mr. Speaker, I notice that others have to present, but I want to say that the same way we achieved our objectives last year, I'm proud to announce that this year we are on target with our objectives, certainly as it relates to food security, as it relates to engaging the farmers We've met with all of them. We continue to meet with them. Poultry farmers, pork farmers, dairy farmers, sheep farmers, um, crop farms, all. We don't leave out any. And I don't expect us to have a perfect score because there are people who are doing great things in a, in a very quiet way and moving along. I want to meet those. I've already made arrangements to meet a seven-year-old whose work came up on loop news. I can't ignore the fact that you have a seven-year-old that is committed and so committed to agriculture and love it so much. So I'm urging the honorable member for St. John to be ready because this weekend ain't going by without me going to see him and his family. This is what we do, Mr. Speaker, sir. So that if I were to Look at our projections for the year 2021 in terms of food production. We have targeted 17 million kilos of food in primary agriculture across majority of crops that we come to know in Barbados. I'm talking about sweet potatoes, bananas, yams, cassava, cucumber, Mom, water, has two more minutes. okras. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, squash, spinach. We are creating a new deal in agriculture, Mr. Speaker, for the people of Barbados to not only be food secure, but to have food sovereignty and to have safe food. This is important. We are creating a situation in Barbados where our tracking and tracing system will protect livestock farmers. And we have work to do because we've, we've been impacted by climate change. Well, Mr. Speaker, I would like to urge all Barbadians to let us keep the conversation on track. And why I'm saying so is because I have to literally control myself so that I do not respond to the salacious nest that is out there in the press. But suffice it to say, no board comprising people of the caliber of the people we have at the BADMC. People like Professor Dr. Troy Lord, and please bear with me, Mr. Speaker, Dr. Janine Comer, okay? Academics would seek to victimize or seek to do unjust to anyone unless there's cause. An injustice to anyone unless there's cost, Mr. Speaker, is not something we would entertain. And I want to place before this honorable chamber that a decision taken to terminate a contract was a hard one. But you do not keep a contract in place when against all other anomalies, a person is writing loans to themselves to the tune of $39,000. 39, 
only remember one has to be very, very careful um, using this forum where, where matters are, are sub judice. Um, it is not procedure to engage in conversation like that where it is pending before a court of justice. Or and, and I'm cognizant that I agree, Mr. Speaker, I do agree, but I'm cognizant that it's not there yet. All right, but I do agree. And, and so therefore, Mr. Speaker, I just want to set the records clear. We do not go around victimizing people. And the reason why I have not responded to this in public is for the exact thing you just mentioned, because there's another matter that is sub judice. All right? But we have to let these things be what they are and understand that we are reasonable and responsible people and that we don't take decisions to hurt people after all I've explained about what we are doing to bring along people. And so, Mr. Speaker, with those few words, I'm obliged to you. Honourable Member for St. James North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to give support to this appropriation bill within the context of a $2 billion reduction in our economic activity over the last year, due, due almost totally to the advent globally of the COVID-19 pandemic. Those circumstances, Mr. Speaker, of which we had nothing to do with and no control over, has resulted in this government having to borrow a billion dollars to keep our people simply alive and safe and physically good in terms of their health and still economically sound. We have unfortunately lost, what, now 40 of our people to this pandemic. Uh, hundreds more, sir, have, have caught it. And uh, the vast majority, of course, thankfully, have recovered, sir, cons the, the, the latest person in fact is to succumb as a constituent of mine and I give her family deep sympathy sir on it but this has been a Herculean task by the government of Barbados and I think that we have done tremendously well uh, in keeping the ship afloat over the last year and indeed since coming to office almost three years ago these estimates uh, speak towards a determination by the government to socially protect the most vulnerable in our society, in our country. And that is the duty of any government, of any policy makers, of any legislative uh, decision makers in any part of the world. In addition, sir, we have had to safeguard the economy after coming in to office with the economy in the gutter, sir. We've had to facilitate, we, we, these estimates also speak towards an attempt, bold attempt to facilitate employment in this country, which has taken a tremendous beating as a result of the, the pandemic, which we've had to face. We're trying to facilitate employment by getting capital works going again, sir, construction, roads, uh, houses, and other aspects of the economy which drive the economy and create employment, sir. And I, I believe that I, more so than most, if not all members of parliament, appreciate this aspect of the appropriation bill, sir, because, as I said before, at least 85% of the households in my constituency, St. James North, have been adversely affected through loss of jobs among at least one member of the household as a result of 
what has taken place over the last year. Because my constituency says it's plum in a tourist belt. Plum, plum, plum. Uh, the vast majority of people either directly or indirectly employed through tourism, and it has been almost devastation, sir. But the resilience of our people, the resilience of my constituents will hold, sir. And we keep hope alive, and we have to come out of this better than how we were when we went in. We have to become, as the Honourable Prime Minister said yesterday, less dependent on tourism, so we can continue de to depend so greatly on one aspect of our economy. Uh, we used to do it before when it was sugar, sir. We had a transformation there, a Barbados Labour Party administration led by uh, the Right Honourable Tom Adams, helping to transform Barbados economy away from that, sir, and creating international business and financial services, sir, and this government has to do that again because it cannot be that we're so dependent on tourism. I therefore, sir, as a member of parliament for St. James North, look forward to um, the projects, sir, such as the rehabilitation of Highway 1 after uh, the phase which it's undergoing now is completed and whereby it comes into my constituency sir from Fortston down to just before Spikestown within the next financial year on road repairs in the constituency sir um, serious need of road repairs about 18 roads which I have continuously written various ministers of transport and works uh, public works uh, over the last, since I became a member of parliament or just over eight years ago, I look forward to to house repairs and to the noble uh, policy, sir, which the Honourable Prime Minister uh, conceptualised of removal of pit toilets from those houses in St. James North which still have pit toilets and, uh, and the replacement by waterborne toilet facilities. But as I said earlier, when the Ministry of Water Resources was in the well, so this has to be tied in, of course, with a rationalisation of the Zone 1 policy, which seriously affects many parts of my constituency and hinders its development. Surely the time has n now come, as it had come before, for us to rationalise this policy and um, pre stop the prohibition of people with all the engineering skills we have and the inability to build waterborne toilet facilities uh, without, of course, compromising the integrity of our water resources. I look forward, sir, as uh, is provided for in the estimates to, for rehabilitation of the Mili Eiffel Western Fish Market Sir, and we seek to develop the Western community and the constituency as well as to the computerization of the Zion Hill um, community center, sir. But COVID presents an opportunity for the reformation and transformation of our economy and our society. And, you know, it's a uh, cliche to say that, look, you should never waste an opportunity and you have to find good, sir, out of, um, out of disaster and optimism, sir, and improvement of our society for the benefit of our people. And I just want to look at two aspects, sir, three in fact, whereby we as a government have to be at the forefront of transforming and reforming the society, sir. Um, one, in terms of our welfare system, two, in terms of our educational system, and three, in terms of our uh, duty and obligation towards persons with disabilities. Uh, the Honourable Member for St. Thomas, who heads the Ministry of People Empowerment, um, surely sees the need why our welfare system needs to be rationalised. 
she's certainly perhaps one of the best, if not the best person among the members of parliament to lead that cause. Um, you know, she's carrying a model for new members of parliament in what representation is. I thank her for the uh, role she played, especially in, in um, looking after the fire victims, helping look after the fire victims from the first fire I had, and I've had three, sir, in my constituency this year, early o'clock, New Year's, New Year's Day, in terms of obtaining accommodation for that family. But our welfare system, and again, the time is now needs to be reformed. I know that there is a committee of cabinet uh, looking into that. I believe it is headed by the honorable member for St. Michael South Central. But uh, we can't continue with a situation, sir, where there is so large intergenerational uh, welfareism, sir, where someone's grandmother being welfare, the parents, and know them, sir. And uh, this will require, of course, a whole of government, a whole of society approach to the issue, sir, uh, but it has to be tackled. We, we have to move away from our people's dependence on welfare. I believe, sir, that the department should carry a new name uh, to, to start with, with a new reformation, maybe human development department or social development department would, would help, sir. Uh, but the reality is, sir, that our educational system and many ministries have to be involved in this approach as well. Our Ministry of Education is again led by an extremely able member of parliament, sir, the Honourable Member for St. Michael Southeast, who brings to her ministerial tasks the passion and commitment to effect change. But the time is now, sir, to effect this change. We need, of course, curriculum reform. We haven't had that for 20 years now. That is paramount. We can't continue, sir, under uh, the system that we now have, sir, which of course was founded still on a colonial system, I believe the 1945 or um, United Kingdom Act still might, still has a foundation for, for some of what we have here. And uh, the reality, sir, is that, that every child is not an academic, every individual certainly will not be an academic, sir. But every individual has worth, every child has worth, every child has some skills. And uh, we have to reach a situation where by less of our children leave school without some form of certification and without some form of skills. Uh, let me say here, sir, I am one of those who strongly support the abolition of the common entrance examination, sir. I know the Honourable Prime Minister, on, the, uh, on our second, no, first anniversary of coming into office, May 2019, when we had a meeting in, um, in, in Bridgetown, would have committed our government to the abolition of the common entrance exam and, and we know the trials and tribulations that our children, uh, especially our primary school children are going through now in terms of online education and I, I know the Honourable Minister is having a meeting with the teachers unions tomorrow to see how we can get our children back in school and uh, physically and the sooner the better sir, this common entrance exam and it is regrettable that uh, I suppose COVID has come along and therefore we are not in a position, as I understand it, to, to remove that, to abolish that exam this year, but certainly I hope by next year it would be. But we have to find a way to create greater opportunities for our young adults to be engaged those who may not be academically inclined to be engaged in technical and vocational uh, opportunities to develop their skills, sir. 
uh, therefore means that we need to find a way to expand the polytechnic by, by whatever name called our skills training programs, um, the facilities whereby we can undertake those skills training programs. Maybe, sir, what we have done in terms of the last year having to have virtual training and education is an opportunity for us to be able to spread the, the, the amount of young people and widen that who can benefit from vocational and skills training. The reality of the situation is that, look, so we, we need people with these skills. I can so, do plumbing or masonry. Whenever something wrong with my plumbing, I go and call my plumber. So, he makes more money than many lawyers, many people in my profession in this country. Ah, I, I need a carpenter. So now my carpenter told me he unavailable for the next two months. Got to find somebody else. Told me that this morning after we spoke on, on, on Sunday. There is opportunity for a young person in these areas, sir. In many areas of technical and vocational, and, and it is incumbent on us, so we owe it to our people, to be able to facilitate these opportunities for them so that they can acquire their skills. Too many of our people, sir, are, don't have sufficient skills, just have the skills to be a general worker. And that was all right, sir. That may be all right in terms of a booming tourism industry, but it is not all right in terms in, in, in periods and eras such as what we're going through, which will happen occasionally. So all of us, I'm sure, all of us, I know for a fact, every day we have constituents who call us, I want a job. I want a government job. A government, sir, can't create any more jobs than it has created. It's created jobs, sir, and admirably so, to defend the sanctity and integrity and the security of our people over the last year in terms of COVID. So you've got jobs at National Conservation Community C Commission, sir, with roads over seven, sorry, with debushing over 700 jobs, protection against the dengue, um, school monitoring jobs, the, the community health officers, sir, all noble uh, advancements and initiatives by the government of Barbados in creating employment on the one hand and in um, protecting our people. But uh, we cannot, we do not have the general worker jobs, which means that people have to have skills, and which means we have to cater and facilitate and help our people. So within um, the Ministry of People Empowerment, so I noticed there's provision, of course, as there all, always is under this government for facilitation of uh, uh, getting parents to be more responsible and to giving them those skills by providing money to Paradox. We, we need to do more of that So, in terms of giving our young people and uh, letting them know what is the responsibility of parents because after all, they, I always say that, that being a parent has probably been my most significant role. One, certainly one of the two most significant roles that I have had. It's nothing that you really read in a book, sir, but you, you need assistance in knowing how to be a responsible parent. And uh, within our educational system, as the honorable member for St. Michael Southeast um, leads the, the, the um, whole drive to reform our educational system, which is, I mean, uh, and this is of obviously one of our most important tasks as a government, uh, we, we have to maintain uh, a situation where our University of the West Indies is, is financially and economically accessible to the poorest person in this society, sir. So, I mean, I reject, sir, what I have read recently about a, a report uh, where the, under the chairmanship of I think Sir Dennis Byron, sir, the former 
head um, chief justice of the Caribbean Court of Justice, sir, which is apparently proposing now doubling of the economic cost to University of the West Indies students. So we, we fought that battle. <laughs> Shortly after we came into office, when the Honourable Minister gave a ministerial statement in this Parliament, when it was um, in, in the other place, uh, uh, removing tuition fees for all Barbarian students, uh, which had been, as I always say, disastrously imposed by the last government sir, on, on, on Barbarians, preventing many of the poorest barbarians from being able to attend, attend university. We have to maintain that um, philosophical uh, position that this Barbados Labour Party has been known for uh, in, in allowing ev anybody who has the qualifications and desire to go to the University of the West Indies to be able to go whether they, they are poor, rich, or middle income, sir. I also support the, and I wish to say, sir, the provision for minimum wage. That concept, nobly led by the Honourable Member for St. Peter, I know the Honourable Member for St. Michael, South Central, spoke extensively, extensively on that this morning, sir, so I won't go over that. I believe that it is a reasonable uh, position to place that minimum wage for now at $8.50 per hour, so is that, that, is, that represents a 34% increase from what it is right now at $6.25 for shop assistance, which has been taken by many employers to be the minimum wage for low income workers across our society in a lot of areas, across our workforce in a lot of areas, sir. And I fully support the government's position on that and look forward to that coming into f force next month. I, within the context of development of our people, our community centers uh, need to be fully utilized. And I know the Honorable Member for St. George South um, is committed to that, sir. Uh, these community centers need to be utilized in the evenings. We can't just have buildings their physical buildings that we paid a lot of money to construct being closed to the, the communities uh, and in that regard i'm happy to see uh, in the estimates provision being made for the establishment of coding and robotics at western community center uh, in during the upcoming financial year uh, Finally, sir, I wish to speak, as I said, on persons with disabilities, sir. I think the whole of Barbados knows that that is one of my passions, improvement of life, sir, persons with disabilities. I have spent, what, last 20, 20 plus years, sir, in that cause, sir. And um, look, the time is now. We've enacted in July last year, the Employment Prevention of Discrimination Act, which was proclaimed in September last year, and persons with disabilities are, are part of that act in terms of preventing discrimination of employment against persons with disabilities, sir. But you know, you, you could pass laws, sir, as we do, and it's our duty and mandate pass laws in this country, but we have to be cognizant that in a lot of cases, the reality is that the implementation is not carried out as we would, we, we would wish it. And uh, sir, the, the plight of persons with disabilities is still of tremendous concern. They represent the most vulnerable in society. We have not had a census sir, since 2010, and again, we were to have one last year, as we do every 10 years. We couldn't have that because of COVID, so we don't know the, the, the exact or approximate numbers of persons with, 
disabilities in Barbados is generally thought to be about between 5 to 7 percent of our population. It is rising, sir, because as people live longer, of course, they are more prone to get disabilities. That is natural, and even Alzheimer's disease, which is a growing problem, uh, of course, um, to, to add to the physical and uh, disabilities that our people have. And of course, we all know that bec uh, because of our history, sir, coming out of slavery, and, and the, the, the trauma that our ancestors uh, underwent because of slavery, sir, we black people in the Caribbean are, 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 are the most prone to diabetes and hypertension and, oh, and, and the consequences of diabetes, uh, amputation of legs, visual impairment, sir, than any other people in the world. Uh, we need a disabilities legislation so I can't be hypocritical. In 2015, I would have, as an opposition MP, in fact, laid um, a private member's bill, a, a resolution rather, calling for it. That was six years ago, middle of March, sir, in this same month, the month for persons with disabilities. We need that separate disabilities legislation, so which gives people with disabilities a heads up as they are entitled to, sir. Uh, affirmative action is needed. We have many people with disabilities, sir, with tremendous brain, better brain than a lot of people who make six, six figure salaries in this country. But they need the opportunity, and the, the opportunity through creation of employment, sir, and, and being given the opportunity not only in the private sector, but in, in government too, and we're lagging in this regard, sir, um, in, from behind some of our sister territories, Jamaica, for example, where 3% of government jobs are reserved for persons with disabilities. So uh, the throne speech last September by Her Excellency would have announced or, or stated the government's intention to establish a disabilities commit, commission, sir. We, of course, have a monitoring commission and uh, monitoring committee already as to mo monitoring how Barbados speaks and treats towards the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which we signed at international level at the United Nations in February, on February 27th, 2013, after signing it, we ratified it on February 27th, 2013, after signing it in May 2008. But um, the establishment of that commission, and I know that the Ministry of People's Empowerment, of course, being the executing ministry, dealing with the fallout in terms of uh, loss of jobs of our people, sir, has been occupied to a large extent with trying to maintain social protection for our people. But this commission, sir, if established, doesn't need to be any talk, sure, sir. We've had enough talk when it comes to people with disabilities over the years. There's in, enough written let, um, material documentation on what we ought to be doing, sir. It needs to be mandated to move ahead to see about the drafting disabilities legislation. Uh, this government, sir, has, has placed in a policy that persons with disabilities together with vulnerable, with persons within communities would, would be eligible for, I think it is 5% of government procurement and government contracts, sir. But again, we have to place people with disabilities in a position where they can take advantage of this policy, which was set by this government by law, I think in December 2018, the legislation was brought to this parliament. And I, I, am, I am concerned that we have not done enough to place in the, the mechanisms whereby persons with disabilities can take advantage of, of this. I know that the Honourable Minister of Education, uh, and she has spoken about it 
in a, in a speech to this parliament last year, also understands the need to improve the education for persons with, with um, special skills uh, uh, within our school system. So, sir, these are, uh, are, are my, my major concerns. I know that there's provision in the appropriation bill to address each of these areas I've mentioned. I urge those ministers responsible and the cabinet to see about this, sir, because this is part of what we need to do. Each of these areas are part of the sustainable development goals uh, that we have subscribed to, um, I think, to, to move um, our country, the world, to uh, by 2030 to the real realization of these goals. Uh, as I said, when, when we sign, as the Honorable Attorney General said as recently as last Friday, when we sign on to an international treaty, um, we in fact give rights, create rights to those persons who are beneficiaries of the treaty, sir. Um, and even though it, uh, national legislation may not be passed, certainly by signing the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities, we have um, treated to persons with disabilities to give them the rights that we have signed on to under that convention, sir. Sir, I have no doubt that under the able leadership of the Honorable Prime Minister, our cabinet, the government as a whole, we will overcome what we have gone through over the last year and we will rise, sir, and be better for it. Uh, we need to, and, and again, COVID has provided the opportunity to, to, for us to fast track, trying to ease doing business in this country because they've had, uh, they've obviously been less face-to-face -face engagement with people, trying to keep people away from the licensing authority as, as much as can happen, immigration department, um, liquor license, uh, which I believe would be coming on, would be coming on stream soon. We have to continue with this because as we ease doing business, we will become more competitive in this country, sir. And, um, sir, we, there's a deficit, sir, which we has to be realized. We've unfortunately, as I said, been forced to borrow a billion dollars because of COVID. Uh, I believe the, the Ministry of Health and it's, and, and the minister led by the, an able Minister of Health, sir, the Honorable Member for the, the City has done the best we can do under the circumstances to maintain the health and physical security of our people, sir. And uh, I am optimistic that as we come out of come out of this pandemic, sir, we will come out the better for it. But we this will not just automatically take place by happen chance. It means every one of us working as hard as we can, giving our 200%, and also the people of Barbados being part of our effort and our drive to, to lift our country up and to make it the best it can be and to give our people the best opportunity we can to bring everybody up, sir. I'm obliged to you. Honorable Leader, Government Business. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. I beg to move the suspension of the sitting until 1.45 p.m. 1.45 p.m. The question is that this honorable chamber be suspended until 1.45 p.m. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. We think the ayes have it. This armor chamber stands suspended until 1.45 p.m.